is a huge crowd. And it's not a surprise. It is such a privilege to be sitting down with you, Sana Marie. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be in Slush again. <laughs> so, you know, at age 34, you became the youngest prime minister in Finnish history, the third female prime minister after a long line of men. Um, and, you know, you took on a job that is typically the culmination of a long career in public service, and you took it on fairly early. So I just have to ask, as an opener, what was it like to be thrust into that position? Well, of course, when you take that kind of position uh, or job, you are never fully prepared. It's always a uh, leap to unknown. Uh, and then when you do the work, when you do the job, then you learn uh, also what the job is. So. It's a leap of faith, uh, you could say, uh, as well. And we have had, in Finland, few female prime ministers, but if we look globally, um, the situation isn't very good. Uh, we have 193 UN countries, and only 13 of them are led by women. Uh, so the world is in very equal on leadership. Not now, ha have, hasn't ever been. Uh, and I only hope that we will see more of female leadership in the world in the future. Absolutely. Well, you know, we're, we're sitting here in front of a, a very big audience of tech founders and uh, investors and people who are really trying to knock down walls and also shatter glass ceilings. And I wonder if you have any advice for them. Well, my main advice is that trust yourself. Um, Believe in yourself. If you are in a position where you are able to take a leadership position, for example, then think that maybe I am capable, maybe I can do this. Especially women, many times, they question themselves. Are they ready for that job? Are they good enough? Are they capable enough? Uh, can they do everything perfectly? Uh, I don't think that men, and actually we have some studies about it, men don't think like that. They think that, yeah, I'm better. I'm, I'm the best one for the job. I think women also need that attitude and they need the support uh, and also the encouragement uh, of taking risks, taking new positions, taking leadership positions, because women are good leaders and, and they are good at their jobs. And if you are on that point where you could take that position, it's because you are good and you are capable. So I just... So I should say that, like, go for it. I I'm sure you can. That's great. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I, I also just have to ask, you know, you went through a lot. I mean, soon after you were elected, COVID took hold of the world. Then you have Russia in invading Ukraine. Uh, you have a very long and complicated relationship with Russia. You've got a very long border with Russia. Can you also take me back to that day when you had heard the news and, and what was going through your mind? Well, I can remember today vividly, uh, like it was yesterday, because uh, we knew back then, uh, by then, that uh, it's probable that Russia will attack Ukraine. Of course, it wasn't a surprise, but everybody hoped that it didn't or it wouldn't happen. Mm. But we knew we had to intel uh, from the states uh, saying that it's probable that Russia will attack. And actually, when you look now back, you can see connect the dots, what happened uh, before uh, the attack on Ukraine. So during that summer, uh, almost half a year uh, earlier, and during that uh, whole fall, uh, Russia used gas and energy resources, uh, for example, to stop energy flows to Europe, uh, making those energy flows uh, go more slowly, so that all the storages in different countries would, uh, would um, uh, go down uh, and that Russia could use energy as a weapon against Europe later on. So we can see the dots now. And also Russia uh, put uh, many troops near Ukrainian border before. They said that it's a drill, they won't attack. It's a drill, they are only training near Ukrainian border. Now we know it, it was a lie, Putin lied uh, to everyone. Uh, and I know that many leaders were in contact uh, with Putin trying to find the diplomatic routes out of the situation. Everybody tried to find uh, diplomatic ways, uh, peaceful ways uh, out of that situation. Uh, and many people talked uh, with Putin before the war started, before the full attack started. And he lied 
to everyone. So now we can see all the dots, what happened before, uh, and we have to learn uh, from, from that, uh, of course. I have said in many stages that uh, Western countries, democratic countries everywhere globally should stop being naive. I think we should wake up uh, to authoritarian regimes, uh, how they function, how they work, how they see the world, what is their logic. And it's very different uh, from the democratic countries. We think and we thought in Russia's case that um, when we have very close ties and connection with Russia, economic ties, business ties, that would secure peace because it would be so costly and so stupid to start a war. Like it is. It's stupid. It's unlogical from our perspective. But authoritarian countries don't think like that. So it didn't prevent anything. Uh, and I think the main uh, mistake were made 2014 when Russia attacked Crimea and Europe uh, and Western countries didn't react strong enough. Uh, and I have also said uh, this in European Council meetings, in, in many uh, stages before, that if we had reacted more strongly then, put more heavy sanctions, show Russia that they cannot act like that, uh, defend Ukraine in that moment and that position, I don't think we should we would have seen uh, the full attack on Ukraine later on. Um, I think Putin really thought that he could just walk to Kiev, people would welcome him, open arms, that the Western countries, democratic countries, wouldn't be strong, that we wouldn't oppose those kind of sanctions, that we wouldn't support Ukraine, that we would take uh, more note on the business side, on economic side, and we would just like, leave Ukraine uh, as it is uh, when, when Russia attacks. So Putin thought that, once again, like 2014, he can just walk in to Ukraine, do whatever he wants. It will be like fast two weeks operation, special operation, as he calls it. Uh, but this wasn't the case. Uh, now we acted united. We put heavy sanctions. We supported Ukraine from the get-go, uh, giving more weapons to Ukraine every day uh, and making sure that they can cope. And they have shown so much heroism uh, during this, these years, very hard times. Uh, they are really heroic and they have defended their country uh, very heroically. And I think we have to do the utmost to support Ukraine from now on and make sure that the war can end as soon as possible. If there will only be some kind of peace, not created by the Ukrainian terms, only some kind of peace, then there will be a long period of grey zone, and I think we would only see wars uh, in that uh, territory once more. So we have to make sure that we are supporting, we are supporting President Zelensky's peace plan. He has made his own uh, peace plan that he has shown to the world. Uh, and also, they have demanded uh, more heavy weaponry, uh, more fastly uh, delivered to Ukraine so that they can really defend and push Russian troops out of Ukraine. And I think we should all focus on this. To also show another authoritarian regimes out there that it doesn't pay off to attack an independent country, that we will react, that we are strong, and that we are not naive anymore. Well, I, I love your stance, and of course, one of your biggest achievements was... <laughs> ...was securing NATO membership for Finland. Of course, that angered uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. I, I'm just wondering, what do you make of the current prime minister's position, decision this week to close off the border entirely for two weeks? Um, to, I guess, stop what he said was asylum seekers coming into the country. And do you think that puts you more at risk uh, down the road? Well, we have seen that Russia uses different tools to trying to shake things up uh, in different countries. And they have actually used migrants before, uh, and also Belarus uh, has used migrants. Uh, and we have seen this kind of situations in the uh, Pelorus Polis border, in different borders, where they're trying to push people uh, out of the, uh, their country to push them uh, across the border. So they're using uh, migrants, they're using uh, asylum seekers um, this way, and of course, it's not acceptable. Um, we have the legislation that enables us uh, to close our borders. We 
created the legislation in our governmental period just in case that things like this uh, should happen or would happen, uh, because we have seen Russia uh, acting like this uh, before. And another thing that we did uh, because of the actions of Russia uh, and what is the state of the country today is that we actually built a fence uh, to the uh, Russian uh, and Finnish border that we didn't have before. We have had, I would say, functioning relationship uh, with Russia for decades, because we are neighboring countries, we have a long border together, so we have had to deal with, with Russia uh, before, uh, and we have had good cooperation in the border uh, before. But now things have changed, and that's why also Finland has to prepare more on securing our own borders uh, from Russia. But I think the most important, one, the most important thing uh, to make sure that we are secure and safe is that the Finnish border nowadays is a NATO border. Mm. You know, you've talked a lot about um, autonomy. You've talked a lot about people's sort of naiv naivete when it comes to uh, dealing with authoritarian uh, governments. And I know that that really factors into uh, this you know, universe, the tech world. You want more tech autonomy as well. Uh, you had talked, I think, last year a little bit about um, Finland's and, and Europe's more broadly reliance on chips from China, for example. Uh, and I just wanted to know, you know, one year on, if we were to sort of uh, establish like a, a grading system, how, how you would rate Finland's progress from A to say, you know, F for failing, uh, how, how you think you're doing on this front as a country? Well, I think Finland is doing actually quite well compared to many other countries. We have a lot of countries in the world that hasn't yet reached that kind of digital state. Uh, and Finland, other Nordic countries, I think many European countries uh, have that uh, capability, has those capabilities and, and are capable when it comes to digitalization and, and digital uh, front. But still we have many things to do. Uh, and when we talk about digital or tech, it's important that we don't only speak about the technology and the like, things that you are creating, for example, but actually that we are talking about people, because everything is to do with people. So I think when we look at tech or di digital, the most important thing is to invest in people, in education, from early childhood to universities, uh, R&D uh, and, and new innovations. Uh, and when uh, we served uh, as a government, we created, together with the opposition parties then, so it was a bipartisan uh, agreement. We agreed uh, in Finland that, that we are aiming uh, to raise our R&D funding up to 4% of our GDP by the year 2030. And I think if every European country would share this kind, kind of um, goal uh, that sounds simple but is actually uh, a very ambitious goal, uh, then we will be better off. Mm -hmm. So we need the people, we need the talent, we need to know how, so we should put our money to education and R&D, and there also comes the digital solutions, the new technological innovations that we will need, not only because it's nice to use different apps or it's nice to have these things, but I'm an optimist and I want to believe that technology can actually help us solving the big issues of the future, like climate change, loss of biodiversity, uh, also uh, dealing with many critical problems, for example, pandemics, uh, etc. So, so we need the technical solutions, we need those innovations, uh, and we need to make sure that we also have the platform and the will uh, to encourage uh, building uh, that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's roughly the same percentage of GDP that the U.S. pours into R&D, so that's really great. Um, you know, I just wonder also what, how you'd grade the European Commission. We sort of watch and, 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 and wait to see, you know, in the U.S. what the uh, European Commission is doing in terms of, you know, the regulatory stuff and... Yeah. Well, I think um, we should uh, work better together. Mm -hmm. um, in many ways, actually, the situation in Ukraine has uh, deepened the relationship between Europe and the states, also Great Britain. So we have a lot of possibilities of working together, and I think it's crucial that democratic countries will connect more, mm -hmm. will cooperate more uh, in, in all of the fronts that, that are critical to our societies. Um, 
I see that Europe, uh, European Commission, uh, European Parliament, Europe uh, as a whole, the whole, uh, all of the, the institutions has a great role of making sure that we have good rules mm. internationally when it comes, for example, big tech or development of, of AI or, yeah, or all of this. So we need the et ethical um, rules uh, and also rules that, that every country in the world uh, would follow uh, and, and, uh, and that they should or, or have to uh, follow. But I'm also a bit afraid, or not maybe afraid, but I can see a lot of risk there if European Commission or and other legislative bodies don't work with the entrepreneurs, business, private sector, with the companies. Because the development and the pace of development of new technologies is so fast mm. uh, that the legislation will always be behind. So I think also here, cooperation is key. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see more and more interaction and cooperation between private and public especially when it comes to digital solutions and when it comes to new technologies. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so when you came to power, um, you did talk about um, Finland sort of, you know, uh, not being left behind and, and try, you know, sort of maybe focusing more on AI. And I just wonder now, um, there's so much good that we're seeing already from AI in terms on, of education and healthcare, but of course, we're also hearing more and more about risks to humanity. Um, potentially in the very near term. So I just wonder if you've changed your mind at all about um, how you view AI and its potential. Well, I believe in development. Uh, and of course, every technology or everything new comes with risks. Uh, there are always that negative side about everything. Um, but there is also a positive side. And that's why I said that I would like to see more and more interaction between the ones that are creating the technology, that are creating uh, these new things mm -hmm. uh, that will help us in many ways uh, with legislative um, uh, people that, that are planning and, and uh, creating the rules uh, for, for these technologies. So I would rather see cooperation uh, and focusing on the positive, also acknowledging that there are risks and that we have to talk about the ethics uh, of these new, new technologies, that there are also problems, but not treat the technologies itself such a risk that we shouldn't uh, walk in that right direction, because I think that it's inevitable. Uh, and hopefully we could move from the discussion from, is, for example, is AI good or bad thing, to more about how should we develop these technologies together, how could we make sure that there are more positive sides than the risks sure. or the negative. Well, Finland has obviously always played a major role in, in gaming and mobile tech, and I just wonder if you think it can sort of um, you know, in the future, if you see it taking center stage uh, on, on this, in this technology, AI or, or uh, in another uh, area? Well, I think Finland is, is doing actually quite a good job, mm -hmm. for example, when it comes to quantum technologies. We are a small country. We don't have massive resources like United States or even big countries in Europe like Germany or, uh, and others. But still, we are doing a top-notch job mm -hmm. with quite small resources. So I would also like to see here, as I said, cooperation between uh, private and public. Mm. I would also like to see more cooperation between countries. Because if we would, for example, in Europe, have the big, big countries' resources mm. uh, and use it in a smart way with cooperation with smaller countries, I think we would do a better job. For example, Estonia, uh, Finland's neighboring country, they are very high on, on technology and digitalization in the entire country, even though they are quite small. So also big countries can learn from small countries, and small countries are doing amazing things yeah. uh, with quite small resources. You know what's interesting to me? Um, I love the work-life balance in Finland, and I also frankly love that there is this sort of aversion to wealth uh, the very extreme opposite of which we see in 
the US and especially in the Bay Area where people I think are sort of valued by how much money they make. Um, but I do wonder if that is uh, sort of a gating factor to um, ambition here or to attracting and retaining entrepreneurs. Well, I think it's very important that you have balance in your life, whether it's work, um, work free time or work family life uh, balance or balance uh, in any ways, because we are individuals, we are human. If you only work, you can work very hard for a certain period of time, but then you will burn out. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's much more um, sensible, actually, to make sure that, that people are of course working, they are ambitious, we should encourage that, but that they will also have free time, that they can spend time with their family and that they will have, for example, good uh, paternity leave uh, system uh, in, in different countries. Uh, we also renewed uh, the parental leave system in, in Finland uh, in the previous government uh, period where, where I led the, the government and we made sure that uh, more time is also giving to the fathers to spend spent with their small children. So, so the, um, the, um, the time that father have to have mm. uh, in, in, this, uh, in this period, uh, we prolong that, uh, and that also gives, of course, mothers uh, possibilities to build their careers. So I think it works in both ways good for women uh, in their careers, but also good for men yeah. in their family life, so that they will also have the opportunity to spend time with their children. And I think, I, I haven't ever met a, a single father who has said, like, I really regret spending time with my kid when he or she was small. <laughs> right. Like, nobody ever says that. Everybody say, is saying, who has used these opportunities, that actually, it really gives me perspective, and it also gives me a lot of drive going back to work, but also understanding that other side uh, of, of our family or our life. So, so I think it's very important that we will have more equal uh, parental life systems and more equal um, worlds when it comes to family life as well. I think the US could learn a lot from Finland. Um, but I also um, wanted to talk to you about the fact that you are, you're not a, a politician anymore, but you are a, a very a much a political consultant now working for the Tony Blair Institute. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And I also wondered what you made of the character, characterization of TBI, I guess it's called, as the McKinsey for world, world leaders, if you think that's apt or not. Well, Tony Blair Institute is working almost in 40 countries uh, globally, advising governments, mm -hmm. advising head of states in different matters. Of course, it varies country to country, uh, whether it's to do with agriculture, technology, uh, or many things. And uh, my job there, uh, I also do many other things that I love, and I actually love the freedom that I now have after serving as a prime minister, which I also appreciate, of course, so much. It was a privilege uh, to be a prime minister in a period of time where almost everything happened. Uh, so it was really hard uh, and really tough, but still rewarding, and, and I really appreciate that I have the opportunity. Uh, to serve my country uh, as a prime minister, but now I have, of course, more freedoms to do also other things. Um, and I'm also open for, for new things. In Blair Institute, my job is to advise uh, head of states, head of governments, uh, and also the governments on, on certain issues. Uh, meet with people, and you know, when um, you are in that position uh, of leadership, uh, leading a country, for example, nobody like, really understands that. You cannot read it in a book, you have to experience it. Sure. So leaders need that kind, of, um, that kind of interaction, to speak with people that really know the job, how hard it is, and all the, the factors that you have to consider uh, doing, doing that job. So that's my job there, uh, but I also do many other things like speaking at different events uh, and, uh, and interact with people. I still want to change the world. I haven't lost my passion about the issues why I went to politics in the first place, like fighting climate change, uh, fight uh, 
loss of biodiversity, working for e more equal worlds, working for human rights. I still have all of those passions, but now different platforms uh, to make an impact and influence. That's wonderful. Well, I mean, you were so popular as a prime minister, and I do wonder, you're so early in your career in the wider arc. I mean, are you interested in going back into politics at some point? I haven't said that I wouldn't ever go back. Like, of course, it's a possibility that at some some day um, I might find that passion to pursue political career once again. But for now, I'm doing also something else. Uh, and I believe that, and I think this is a good advice for uh, also uh, to you, that, that I think and I believe that you should always close some doors mm -hmm. to open new ones. If you're only like building everything at the same time, then you don't have the energy to focus on new matters and new things. So, so I believe closing some doors, doing something else, finding new paths, uh, and it has worked well for me for so far. So I never have had like five years or 10 year plan, career plan or any plan of that sort. Um, I believe like opportunities will come to you and then you have the possibility to take them or not. You can always choose. Uh, but don't plan too much your life because life is always a mystery and, and it's always unknown. Right. And that's why it's so interesting. <laughs> so wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much, Sana. Really pleasure. Thank you. Thank you Thanks so much. Everyone. It was lovely. Oh, thank you.